There's a feeling you get after days of not eating. It's like there's this knot in the pit of your stomach you're not sure will ever untie as it twists and turns trying to convince you to eat. I spent my childhood living in poverty. I grew up in rundown trailer parks, condemned buildings, and I even lived in a school bus. My mother was a pharmacy technician with a college diploma earning $6.50 an hour. On weekends, to supplement our income, my family went dumpster diving. It was lucrative. This one time we found like a hundred boxes of expired Ferrero Rocher, still sealed in the packaging. I really struggled with whether or not I was actually poor growing up, because while my family moved every time we couldn't pay the rent, and our fridge never contained anything more than condiments, my grandparents on both sides of my family lived extremely wealthy lifestyles in their beachfront properties. My summers were spent lounging on the beach and scraping food scraps into the compost. During the school year, I was lucky if I ate more than one meal a day. When I found out I was going to be giving a talk, I told my friends and family. One of my wealthy relatives asked me what my talk was on, and when I told them it was about poverty reduction and the living wage, they asked me if I had heard about the power of positive thought. It made me realize that I have a unique perspective because I've experienced several different economic lifestyles. I remember this one Christmas dinner party. We arrived, and immediately my grandparents dressed me up in this beautiful purple velvet dress with rhinestones and a matching beret. I loved that dress. At the end of the party, after the guests had gone and my porcelain doll duties were done, my grandparents took the dress back. They delicately folded it away in their dresser as I put my dirty clothes back on. The thing about poverty is that it's always someone else's problem. And I learned a hard lesson early on. Family doesn't help family. You help yourself. I remember sitting in the welfare office this one time after a move. We didn't get our welfare check because it went to the wrong mailbox. We literally had no money. It was mid-afternoon. I hadn't eaten yet that day, and I started to cry because my stomach hurt so much. My mother kept telling me, just a little longer and we can get some food. There was a homeless man in the waiting room with us. He was filthy, but he had this little tin with him, and he slowly waved me over, opening the lid for me to peek inside. It was almost empty, but there were a few sweet tarts in the bottom, and he let me have a few. Family might not always help family, but sometimes strangers and people with nothing at all will surprise you. We have this expectation that children should share everything they have. And despite growing up in poverty, I had been taught this age-old lesson. That's why it made it so difficult for me to understand why no one would help us. To me, people were ignorant of our poverty. At 10 years old, I knew I had to save myself and my two younger brothers. I had called the police before, when my mother's boyfriend beat her up, but this time was different. She hadn't been home for a couple of days. There was no food left in our house. I made the decision to call social services and report her. There's a power in human experience. It's why we share stories. I'm sharing my story because it's why I'm so passionate about poverty reduction and the living wage. There's a risk in sharing something so personal, but it's a risk I'm willing to take if it means that action will replace inaction. I cannot stand idly by while children are going through similar, if not worse, experiences that I went through. We cannot stand idly by while vulnerable people are taken advantage of. I got a second chance to live, but there are still 1.4 million Canadian children living in poverty. 
there's this idea that poor people don't deserve nice things. I didn't deserve the purple dress, and low-wage workers don't deserve good-paying jobs. The problem with this is that poverty rates are rising due to a lack of decent full-time jobs with wages and benefits that enable parents to lift their families out of poverty. In Canada, one in four single parents lives below the poverty line. My mother was one of these single parents, working a full-time job, earning a minimum wage of $6.50 an hour. The only thing that would have raised our family out of poverty is a higher wage, a living wage. Today's Canadian family earns $55,930 a year. Low-income families earn $15,880 a year. $12,000 below the poverty line. To give you a comparison, I still think that $15,880 is a lot of money because it's about $2,300 more than my mother's 1996 full-time income. Let's think about that for a minute. My mother's 1996 full-time income was only $2,300 more than that of today's low-income family. I'd just like to point out that the income of a family living above the poverty line increased $19,630 in the same time frame. I think it's fair to say that our poor are being left behind while the rest of the population moves forward. After I was apprehended from my mother, I started doing normal childhood things. I rode my bike, I played with friends, I ate breakfast every day and showered regularly. I also learned to brush my teeth and went to the dentist for the first time. We actually got kicked out because I wouldn't stop screaming. On top of needing a tooth pulled, I also required eight fillings. My family footed the bill to fix my teeth, but had I been a ward of the state, it would have been on the taxpayer's dime. It is a proven fact that people who are poor use more health care dollars. Our communities are paying for low wages in the form of weak local economies, high tax burdens, crippling debts, and more. If we paid poor people enough to eat healthier, it could save our communities and taxpayers a considerable, considerable amount of money. Why should you care about poverty? Why should we all care about poverty? What if it was your loved one standing here, sharing this story? What if it was you? What if there was no one fighting for you? No one advocating for you? There's a way to put an end to poverty, and it's called the living wage. How it works is quite simple pay people enough to live. The living wage might not be the answer to poverty, but what if it is? What if we can make a difference in the lives of millions of people living below the poverty line? Isn't it at least worth a shot? The living wage is different than the minimum wage. Minimum wage is not based on community costing. Minimum wage is not indexed to inflation. And the sad reality is that increases to minimum wage have done next to nothing to help the millions of low-wage workers. So what is a living wage? A living wage is the hourly amount a family needs to earn to cover basic expenses such as food, clothing, rental housing, child care, and transportation in a specific community. The living wage is a global movement advocating for higher wages by calculating actual community costing on an annual basis. The average living wage across Canada is around $17 an hour, 
$4 an hour more than the highest minimum wage in the country. To give you a little insight on the calculation process, every couple years, Health Canada commissions the provincial health authorities to complete food surveys. Basically, people go to the grocery store with a list and tell Health Canada how much things cost in specific regions. This data is then published and used to tell us the cost of a healthy diet. The average cost of a healthy diet for a female aged 31 to 50 years old is $231 a month. This data is published and it's used by every living wage calculation in the province of British Columbia. The living wage does not cover debt repayment. It doesn't cover savings for future home ownership, retirement, or a child's post-secondary education. It doesn't cover the cost of caring for a seriously ill or disabled family member. To say that people living in poverty have to make tough choices, it is an understatement. The living wage is a bare bones calculation. It's nice to know the cost of living in our communities, but what do we do with this information once we have it? The living wage encourages businesses to take a stand against poverty by becoming certified living wage employers. These employers, once certified, agree to pay no less than the living wage to all of their workers and third-party contract workers in their communities. Over 80 companies, employing more than 8,000 workers across the province of British Columbia, have become certified living wage employers. People will tell you that paying a living wage is not possible. People will tell you that raising minimum wage is not possible. It costs too much money. It's not the responsibility of hardworking individuals to pay for people who can't pay for themselves. I learned early on that I could only rely on one person. But that's not true. I had help from social safety nets, systems and institutions that are in place because long ago we decided that we have a social responsibility to one another. It's the reason the homeless man shared his sweethearts with me. Poverty belongs to all of us. And when we do nothing about it, we send a message that it's okay. Today's pop culture has an obsession with superheroes. We like the idea of good vanquishing evil. I'm here to tell you that we don't need a suit to be a hero. We just need to speak up, stand up, and advocate for people who need our help. Over 50 communities across Canada have developed living wage calculations. I have personally worked with the Living Wage for Families campaign out of Vancouver to start calculations in seven communities. We like to believe that one person cannot make a difference in this world. But individually, we can calculate the cost of living in our communities. Individually, we can champion businesses to become certified living wage employers. Individually, we can take a stand against poverty. And if individually we do all of these things, together we can make a difference. Together we can put an end to poverty. Thank you.